Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective who's been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Dateline, and Court TV. Now, we join him as he applies his investigative skills to making a case for Christianity. Thanks for joining me at Cold Case Christianity. I'm Jay Warner Wallace. Today we're going to be talking about a couple of my personal uh, concerns, my largest concerns, greatest concerns, about the relationship between science and Christianity. And I think this is one of those uh, unique times in history where the, um, the confrontation or the rub or the relationship between these two uh, aspects of culture, aspects of our world, seem to be uh, in a heightened state. Uh, we're all more and more concerned, I think, about this relationship, and we all are thinking about it probably more than we ever have before, especially since COVID hit us last year, and pretty much everything in our world has become politicized in the sense that now we have a sense of adversarial view of each other, Christians and uh, people who respect science, people who respect Christianity, people who follow Jesus, people who might follow the scientists. These seem to be at polar extremes right now, and so I have a couple of concerns that I want to address with you about the relationship between Christianity and science and some truth, historic truth, that may help us to pave a way forward. So here's my first concern about the relationship between Christianity and science. There's a sense that these two aspects of our world, these two ways of thinking are opposed and are impossibly, foreverly, forever, uh, irreconcilably uh, uh, opposed to each other. That there's no way to reconcile um, science and a view of the world, which is scientific, with a view of the world in which God exists and Christianity is true. Is that really the case? I mean, is that, look, I, I'm concerned about it because this has not historically been the case in the church. It has not historically been the case for Christians, but it certainly seems to be the case now. I think a lot of this comes down to the politic uh, how everything's been politicized so deeply that we cannot think of anything without uh, attaching it to our political affiliations. So when it comes to, like, for example, and COVID just exacerbated this, did it not? Uh, the whole idea, should we wear masks? Should we not wear masks? If I wear a mask, am I stating my uh, allegiance to one political side of the aisle over another? If I don't wear a mask, am I citing my uh, allegiance to um, one worldview over the other? Oh, should I get vaccinated? Um, well, if I, if I get vaccinated, am I kind of bending my knee and, and, uh, and, and showing my allegiance to one side over the... Do you see what's happened? Everything seems to be reduced to a political statement. And as that's happened, I think we've been more and more polarized. By the way, have you not seen that every argument for wearing masks or not wearing masks, for being a vaccinated or not being vaccinated, ultimately comes down to whether or not this respects the science, the science says. And so we have a lot of us who maybe have a, another reason or some other reason to resist wearing a mask or getting vaccinated, um, then appear to the other side as though we are anti-science. And we, of course, if we are take that position, we become more and more distrustful of science. And how many times in the last year have we seen legitimately that science hasn't always led us to the correct conclusion and that the science sometimes is a matter of interpretation. And like we always say, science doesn't say anything. Scientists do. And if scientists hold a view of the world, which is incorrect, then don't be surprised when they make an incorrect inference based on their view of the world. Two people can look at the exact same scientific data and come to two different conclusions based on how they see the world to begin with. All of this just means that we become more and more polarized. And my concern is that we have a sense that we cannot ever be reconciled to the sciences. We cannot ever be somebody who's a Christ follower and participate in that endeavor over there called science. Well, look, this concerns me because it has not historically been the case. And I, I just got done writing a book, which is now available for pre-order. It is called Person of Interest. And this book is really an effort to, to make a case for the deity of, of Christ, for the historicity of Jesus, without ever referring being, or standing on the, the, the writings of the New Testament. You could actually make a case for the deity of Jesus and the historicity of Jesus from nothing more than human history. And one aspect of human history is the history of the sciences. 
And I, I tried to make a point of saying this, and by the way, you can uh, order that right now. The pre-order's got a ton of, of bonus materials that are available from our website, personofinterestbook.com, personofinterestbook.com. Now, look, my point here is to say this, that the history of science is really revealing in terms of the impact that Jesus and his followers had on the sciences. As a matter of fact, in one chapter of the new book, I make a case for why the Christian worldview inaugurated by Jesus actually ignites science as we know it today and accounts for the rise of scientists, all who came from a Christian worldview, who became the, the, the leading tip of the spear, the leading edge of the scientific revolution and actually became the fathers of all major scientific disciplines even as we experience them today. As a matter of fact, we've, I've illustrated this book with, with uh, four, over 400 illustrations. And just that, that roll call of historic scientists that are in the chapter on science is worth the price of admission. This book is really, in some ways, like a graphic novel. And, and what I try to do in this book is to show you that, that you don't need to step away from science as a Christian. As a matter of fact, history has demonstrated that some of the greatest scientific minds were also Jesus followers, who had no problem reconciling their view of the world, which included the miraculous, all of the miracles that Jesus performed, uh, and the virgin birth of Jesus, the, uh, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus were, in their minds, facts of history. At the same time, they were able to explore every aspect of science as we know it today, uh, and not abandoned their views of the miraculous, and uh, there was no contradiction for them. They, they found no rub between their Christian worldviews and their scientific endeavors. For this, for, for all generations, really up until recent times, um, Christianity and science, has, has been, they have been cohabitants in, in the lives of scientists who not just participated in the sciences, but innovated the sciences. In the book, I'll give you a complete list of all the, the, the fathers of science who claim a Christian identity. And, and I've done some of this online too. There, I've got one article online that is the historical roll call of scientific and intellectual thinkers, philosophical thinkers over history. And, and that one article is about one eighth of what I talk about in the chapter in the book. But it just kind of scratches at the surface and it'll help you to see that, no, that the Christians have dominated the sciences. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you realize this or not, but, but the Nobel Prize laureates in the science have been large, over 60% of them have been Christians. The next largest group is Jewish believers. So from the Judeo-Christian worldview come about 90% of the Nobel uh, laureates in sciences. As far as atheists and agnostics, they, they are less than 10% of those who win the Nobel Prize. And so, so it's, you, don't, you do not have to abandon your Christian worldview in order to embrace what science teaches. Remember, we're using the same process. We're, we're collecting data, collecting the facts as scientists, and then we're going to make one of several kinds of inferences from the science. Science doesn't say anything. The Christian who's inferring something from the science, the scientist that is inferring something from the science, that's who gets to say something. And if you're committed to an atheistic worldview, well then yeah, you're going you're gonna to find a way to infer that there's an atheistic explanation. You're going to see it from that worldview. And, and so what we see now is a growing number of people who have absolutely rejected any claims of the miraculous but it turns out that historically, Christians have been able to do cutting-edge scientific work even though they held to a view that included some form of supernaturalism. So uh, my biggest fear, one of my biggest fears, is just that we are simply stuck in this rut right now based on, and by the way, if you don't think that the enemy, if you don't think that the other side even, of those people who maybe hold a secular atheist worldview, do not want to take, they want to take this kind of an approach, an approach that puts us at odds with the science. I mean, this is really becoming, look, right now, scientists, probably, probably until 2020, I, I think up till 2020, uh, the, the one most trusted group for facts and data and inferences was scientists, right? 
Theologians and pastors and Christians are well below those. And so because we're in a world that venerates scientists and venerates what they say, have you noticed then that all they need to say is, well, look, we're following the science. We want to be respectful of the science. How many times have you heard someone position a claim by prefacing it that way? No, we hold this claim, we hold this view because we got there from the science. As if that ends the discussion, right? I mean, science is so well respected. Well, it turns out in person of interest, what I tried to do is to show you that the foremost leaders in science also wrote about Jesus. And you could reconstruct the story of Jesus entirely just from the writings of the fathers of all the major disciplines in science. They happen to be Christ followers. And they wrote about Jesus. And you could reconstruct, if you destroyed every New Testament, if you destroyed every manuscript of biblical uh, New Testament manuscript, you would still be stuck with the Jesus that you and I know today just from the writings of the Science Fathers. You're probably not likely going to want to destroy all the writings of the Science Fathers, but you'd have to in order to erase Jesus from the map. Science is not incompatible with Christianity. You can hold both views simultaneously. But my fear is that we've gotten to a point where um, that no one thinks of it that way, and Christians are willing to surrender their view, surrender a high view of science, because they think it's 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 antithetical to Christianity. Well, it's great if 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 the other side wants to position it so that you cannot be a science follower and also be a Jesus follower. That's what they want us to think, but that is not actually true historically. And it doesn't need to be true for you and I. And that brings me to my second fear, which we'll talk about right after the break. There is a difference between a fact and an inference. It's so, this is so important, right? Now, a lot of you are taking courses in philosophy or you've had a background in philosophy, so I get it. Uh, this may be, um, I'm not, I'm not be stating this in a way that is consistent with the history of philosophy on issues of epistemology, but this is how we would talk about it in front of a jury. Okay, so I just want to offer it to you that way. Here's what I mean when I say that there's a difference between a fact and an inference. On your screen, you see that facts are the kinds of pieces of evidence that we use and from which we... Um, infer a conclusion. So we get these facts together and we present them to a jury and we have a case now in which we think we've made the case that this defendant is guilty on the basis of these facts on one side of your screen and the case file, the inference, the conclusion on the other side of the screen. Now, wouldn't it be great if the only thing that was uh, in play here were just the facts and, and, and you, you know, we teach you the rules of evidence, so here are the rules of evidence we've taught you, and all you have weighing on this decision, impacting this decision, influencing this decision, is just the, the raw facts and the rules of evidence that guide your thought process. But unfortunately, you know as well as I do, that's not all that's in play with jurors. Jurors can watch the same case and come to different conclusions. Why does that happen? Well, because there are other things in play. Each of us is wired differently, even shaped, created differently, gifted differently by God. Each of us has got our own set of memories, our own set of experiences that we bring to the table. Each of us has got our own preferences, our own biases. We're all got some preference or bias, I get that. And each of us has got some set of passions that pulls us in one direction or the other. And it turns out all of these things that I'm listing for you on the screen, these are the things that often decide how we infer from facts. It's kind of like we start off in the same place, like this car, and, and we, you know, there's a couple of different places we could end up. And what determines how we end up in one place or the other is all that stuff we just talked about. This is the stuff that sometimes is every bit as powerful, if not more powerful, than the actual evidence itself. So I'll give you an example of how this might play out. As an apologist, I see this also. You know, we've got some set of uh, evidences here. I'm showing them as scientific evidences. And some people will look at the evidence from science and they are committed to the belief that the evidence makes a good, strong case for Darwinian evolution. 
that they think is the most proper inference from evidence. Yet, I wrote a whole book called God's Crime Scene in which I used the exact same set of physical evidences and I hope demonstrated why the best inference from those evidences was in fact Christian theism. Now, how is it that both of us in two different groups can be using the same set of scientific evidences, but then end up in two different places? Well, it's that stuff in the middle we just talked about. Often, it's that stuff in the middle. Now, I will also just give you a little extra bonus for this session, my pet peeve with this expression, settled science. I hear this all the time, this idea of settled science, even in, in the criminal trials. As if to say that, you know, the inference of Darwinian evolution is settled science. I hear this all the time. Oh, evolution is settled science. Really? How could that ever be? Now, there are, look, I, I, you might be able to say on this side that there is uh, settled facts because we can look and say, well, look, you know, I found his fingerprint there. That's a fact. I did find his DNA over here. That's a fact. But the inference from those facts, that's something entirely different. You, can, you could definitely both agree it's settled that there was a fingerprint and DNA on this podium. But what to infer from that, that's not settled. That's an inference. So at least let's be fair about this. There are settled, we could probably get closer to settled facts than we could ever get closer to settled inferences. Inferences are what we infer from the stuff that is, is clear to us that we both agree on. By the way, both sides, defense attorneys and prosecutors, will agree that, the, as a matter of fact, often we'll present six weeks of evidence in a criminal trial, and that person, as the defense attorney, that person will not present any new evidence. They'll simply offer a better, what they think is a better inference from the evidence we've already presented. So they already agree that the, the facts are settled, but the inference from facts, that's not settled. So if we're going to say that, that, that uh, um, Darwinism or that Darwinian evolution is settled, it's settled science, we simply have applied the word settled to the wrong side of the screen. Facts can be settled. The evidence at the scene can be settled. But the inference from the evidence, that's something that requires our thinking processes. That's not settled. Thanks so much for watching our video. If it was helpful and useful to you, I'd really appreciate it if you would follow us, subscribe to our channel at the bottom link here in the video, and tell your friends. And please follow us on social media. Okay, so here's my second concern uh, related to the relationship between Christianity and science. My second concern is that we will voluntarily surrender the lead in the sciences. We'll voluntarily surrender the lead in the sciences. It's happened before. Other believers who used to play a, a leading edge role in the sciences have surrendered that role for theological reasons, it appears. Here's what I'm talking about. Um, in the book, Person of Interest, I started to chart the history of science based just on the foremost scientists in each century. And I basically grafted this information on a chart. And that chart, I'm not gonna be able to show you all of this. Uh, that's why we write books instead of, we can't make all this in the video. But the point is, if you were to look at this entire chart, you will see there's a rise of Christian involvement. And it happens over time. As you see the number of scientists that, that are in, involved in the sciences over time, in the sciences over time, uh, more and more of them become are Christians. As a matter of fact, Jesus stands at the beginning of a wave of science. That could be just coincidence, or it could be that Jesus was a catalyst. And that's really the question we have. Jesus could have appeared anywhere in that timeline, but he appears right before the climb of the sciences. Now, several little data points I have marked along the way, and they are Christian data points in Christian history because we have been integrally involved in the sciences. But there's a data point in that I talk about in the book that is not Christian at all because up until the Middle Ages, the theological group, the, the, the group of theists that probably had one of the largest impacts on sciences, along with Christians, was Muslims. Muslims had an equal footing in the sciences until about the Middle Ages. And then suddenly, they kind of just drop off the map in terms of their involvement. It's weird. As a matter of fact, some stuff has been uh, written about this. The, uh, one book called The Closing of the, of the Muslim Mind kind of tries to explore this. And there's a sense in which um, 
a, a, a set, a, a kind of a theological group that grows out of Islam that argues that if it's not written in Scripture, it doesn't need, it, it's not true anyway, so what's the point in examining the sciences to f discover something about the world? If there is something about the world that's worthy of being discovered, it'll be in Scripture. And it's this kind of retreat in isolationism that retreats back to just what can be known from the written word that I think accounts for why Muslims eventually step back from the sciences and you don't see the involvement. By the time we get to the scientific revolution, and this is a period of time, a couple of centuries, in which all of the modern disciplines of sciences are, of the sciences are born, by the time we get to that point, Muslims are not playing a major role in the sciences. It's all Christian. The sciences exploded during that one period of time known as Christendom. Why? By the way, it, to say that this is a coincidence, look, people say, oh, well, look, the reason why the scientific revolution involves so many Christians is because that's all the world was Christian. Do you think, honestly, all that was out there was Christians? You don't know anything about the demographics of the world. If you count the people in Persia, Asia, all over the Middle East, you will see that we are greatly outnumbered by other people groups, yet Christians led the way in the sciences. Why? And why is it that Muslims dropped out? Well, this idea that we might retreat back and say, you know what, we're not gonna pay attention to what we can learn in the physical sciences. We're just going to, to look to our scriptures. Well, the great thing about Christianity is that Christianity argues there are two ways that God has revealed to us. You'll see this in Psalm 19 and in Psalm in uh, Romans 1, that God can be seen not only in the scriptures, the special revelation of the book, but it can also be seen in the natural revelation of the world around us. So that Christians exploring the sciences were actually exploring God's nature as revealed to us, not just in the scriptures, but in the world around us. And, and this became such a huge part of the exploration of, of the sciences that folks were, were actually um, investigating the sciences because they felt like they were God was speaking to them through the natural world. That uh, exploration of astronomy or chemistry or any other aspect of the sciences was revealing something about the nature of God. And why does that matter? Because unlike maybe um, those of us who aren't Christians, who are exploring the sciences because we're geeked out about science, those of us who were Christians who were exploring the sciences were exploring them as a form of devotion and worship. And that level of commitment was very different than those who were just exploring them as a matter of interest. And so in the end, my fear is, well, look, if it could happen to the Muslims, where they could take the lead and they could be incredibly involved, especially in astronomy, uh, in mathematics. And yet now, our, our, you, in, other, in order to say, hey, the father of, in order for a Muslim to say that we, led, we're, we lead in some area of science, he or she has to point back to the Middle Ages. Look, is that where we're gonna be? Now I've charted in, in person of interest, I have charted all of the uh, involvement of, of of Christians in the sciences over the generations, including those who are still alive today. And make no mistake about it, Christians today are still engaged in the sciences. And they are still winning every major scientific award that is known to mankind. Make no mistake about it. And I talk about that, and I even list all the awards. All that stuff is available to you in person of interest. As a matter of fact, our bibliography on our footnotes on just these sections, this chapter in science is outrageous. It's so large, we have to kick it out to you as a PDF file. It's just too big to print. It's like three to one the size of the uh, end notes to the actual book. So we don't wanna burden you with all of that data unless you want it, which you can get it on a PDF file. So my point though is, there is our, there's an incredible amount of data in the generation that's still alive today Scientists who are still doing work today, who are award-winning scientists. But my fear is that if we continue to see ourselves at odds with science, if we continue to, to take a modern view, we're like, hey, you know what? I can't agree with, I can't like, like to get involved in the sciences, does that mean that you have to change your religious identity? Could you, you have to abandon your Christian identity to be involved in the sciences? Is that where we are? Do you, in other words, have you, have you politicized everything, for example, to the point where you feel like 
uh, in order to vote a certain way, you have to have a certain consideration of the sciences. In other words, does one side of the political aisle own the sciences at a higher level than another side of the political aisle? That's the question I have to ask you. And you got to ask yourself this. I mean, are you the kind of look? How much of uh, how many Christian parents are skeptical even of higher education right now? Because you feel like education, for the most part, is um, is is antithetical and uh, harsh in its view of Christianity. I'm like, you know, I'm not sure I want to send my kids to. Well, it turns out if you want your kids to be uh, scientists coming out of some of the finer institutions that teach science, we have to be brave enough to know that Christianity is true and we can defend it and we can hold on to it, even in the years in which we are in university, and have to have a view of the sciences, which, which is much like the view held by the science fathers, most of whom were Christ followers, and by the leaders in the scientific revolution, most of which were Christ followers. And we have to make sure that we understand there's a difference between data mining the science, looking for the facts that can be uncovered by scientific processes, and making inferences from the sciences based on a worldview. It turns out, I wrote a book called God's Crime Scene, where I just looked at all the science, the cosmological evidence, all the science about the, the universe, mind, all of these things, and you'll, you'll see that I make a case for the existence of God from the same data points that some will make a case against God. So it's about how we infer from the data, but the science just gives us the data. Then we can make an inference based on the data we gather. Look, my biggest fear is that we are going to abandon our position of leadership in the sciences, a position that we held for centuries and that we need not abandon. You know, the Muslims didn't have to abandon their participation in the sciences either. That was a choice that they made. Let's not make the same mistake. Two of my concerns about the sciences. That number one, we see these as irreconcilably different, as irreconcilably incompatible, that these cannot be held in the same mind, cannot hold a religious worldview and a scientific worldview. That is just not true. And two, that we will voluntarily abandon our position of leadership in the sciences, and we ought not do that. Hope that helps you to think about what you believe in terms of your Christian worldview and the role of science in our world. And I'll see you right here next week at Cold Case Christianity. To hear more from Jay Warner Wallace, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For more information on this week's topic, visit youtube.com slash coldcasechristianity with Jay Warner Wallace. Thank you for joining us on this Cold Case Christianity broadcast.